Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad that you are here. Everybody that's new, let me say hi to you as well. I know Sarah did and uh, excited for a great, great uh, day as we welcome you to find your people. Now listen, I don't know about you, but uh, but I didn't show up today uh, just to stay the same. Did you? You ever think in the morning on Sunday mornings, why am I going to church? You ever think about that? Uh, I do, and I think, you know what, I don't want to go to church and just be the same. I want to go to church, uh, and I want to grow, and I want to be all that God's called me to be, and I want us, us as a church to be all that God's called us to be, so let's step together fully into the plans that He has for us. Does that sound good? Yeah. Good, all right, so I'm excited about it. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, Mark chapter 10. Uh, we're going to walk right through that uh, a passage in there. We're going to look at Bartimaeus, the uh, blind beggar, and uh, see what we can learn from that. Now, while you're turning there, I'm going to tell you a little little uh, disclaimer here today. Some of you, you might be able to see it. You might not because it's new. Uh, but I have a little bit of a mustache. I do. It's, it, I know you can't see it, but it's there. And this week, let me tell you why I have it. This week, we were on... Uh, a family reunion trip to uh, Marcy's parents' cottage up in Canada. It's an annual thing that we do, and uh, they don't have any electricity, and so I was using a shaver, and I forgot to shave this part because I don't have a mirror. And I sat down next to Marcy. She said, hey, you didn't shave your lip. And I touched it and said, you don't, I didn't shave. I forgot. Then she goes on as a supportive wife and mocks me for how silly— <laughs> I look with a mustache. This was on Monday, and so I said to her, I'm not going to shave it the rest of the week, simply because you said that. Well, we get down to like yesterday or the day before, and she says in front of family, she says he will not keep that, he will not show up to church on Sunday with that mustache. Now, if you know me, you know that if you challenge me or tell me that I can't do something, it's a character flaw. It becomes the, the absolute focus of my existence to prove you wrong. So here I am. I might shave at 1 o'clock today, but I'm going to give you an open season to make fun of me, to tell me that I'm not man enough to grow one, to tell me that I look ridiculous, which I think I do. All right, I agree with you. This is your chance. But I'm telling you, I won. That's the key thing. Now let's focus on Jesus. Okay, Mark chapter 10. Let's go to verses 46. We're going to read 46 through 49, and then we're going to go on uh, uh, 50 through 52 in a few minutes. But the blind, the blind beggar, his name's Bartimaeus, uh, Jesus interacts with him, and something unbelievable happens, and we're going to learn a lot from our Lord here today. So let's just read these opening verses to the story, and then we will walk through it, okay? Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. Now, what we don't know is if was Timaeus was a, a prominent man and the son of that prominent man. Some theologians say yes, we're not really sure, but he was, that's what it meant, son of Timaeus. Verse 47, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, I love this, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and, and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 39, or excuse me, 49. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet. He, meaning Jesus, is calling you. And we'll stop right there and we'll finish it as we go along. And so here's the context of what's going on. Uh, as Jesus was famous for, uh, he drew large crowds during his ministry. And he was, he'd come into the city of Jericho. It appears that he's leaving the city of Jericho. And as he's leaving, a large crowd, of course, uh, is there uh, with him. And uh, he runs into and or hears, sounds like he hears, uh, a blind man. Of course, we know his name. His name is Bartimaeus. Now, but let's talk about Bartimaeus for a minute. We don't know a whole lot about him, but here's what we do know. I think we can all relate to this, 
okay? Uh, we need to remember that Bartimaeus, although he was looked at in first century as a beggar, and we'll talk about that in just a minute because he was blind, but you need to remember just personally that Bartimaeus was a son. He was the son of some mama out there. He was the son of some father out there, right? And um, this young man uh, is, is a son, or let's, for our conversation here today, a son or a daughter, just like you. Uh, and you, you need to remember this. You are someone's son or daughter. You have parents. That means at some point in your life or their lives, there were dreams. There was hope and there was excitement. There was joy and there was anticipation somewhere along the line. And I want you to know this, if there wasn't for you, and maybe that's part of your, part of your wound, uh, regardless, for most of us, we had around us some type of celebration saying, hey, I'm glad you're in the world. I'm glad that you were born. And if that isn't you and you don't feel that way, we want you to know today that we feel that about you as a church. We were glad you're, we're glad that you were born. And we're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're part of this church here, at least for an hour, hopefully for a lifetime. We want you to know this, okay? So he's someone's son. He's, uh, uh, he's, he's got a mama, and this is hard, and he's on the side of the road, okay? And this young man comes into the world. We don't know when. We don't know if he's born blind. We don't know if he had some kind of degenerative disease that caused him to go blind. We, we really don't know, but some, whether it started off bad or it got bad, we're not sure, but we know that he finds himself, the son of Timaeus, and he's at the road begging. He's in a very bad, stuck situation in life, all right? And our heart needs to go out to him. And as I was thinking about this, um, uh, I was thinking around what we are talking about, find your people. And a couple of questions came to mind when it came to Bartimaeus and then how it comes to us. And question number one is, um, uh, as we're trying to figure this out, is it better when everybody knows the problem that you have should be up here? There you go. Is it better when everybody knows the problem you have, like Bartimaeus, everybody knew it, or is it better when you suffer in silence? couple questions for you, right? And I was in rehearsal and I said, you know, sometimes generationally, the answer's there. <laughs> you know, sometimes people are like, just, just buck up. You're fine. Go forward, right? Other generations are saying, let everybody know, and we air all of our dirty laundry, right? There's all this balance going on and, and different thoughts. But is it better when everybody knows the problem you have, or is it better when you suffer in silence? Just kind of put those questions there for a minute. Like this guy, people... Um, look at him, um, meaning Bartimaeus, and um, they know he's blind. They know in that day that this is his issue. That is his issue, and everybody knew about it, okay? Um, but I believe in this room here today, many of us have issues, but nobody knows about those issues. There are things that some of you today um, are in silence about, and you're suffering uh, in the midst of that silence for whatever that thing is for you and you feel like you're isolated you feel like you're alone and you look at that question and think i don't think it's better for me to suffer in silence but i don't know how to talk about it i don't know who to talk about it with i don't know what's going to happen if i do bring it up or right and so you're suffering in silence some of you are that way here today and that's kind of what uh one of the motivations of the series is find your people right um, so, and you might say, and I, and I might say this as well, but maybe neither one is better than the other. Silence, everybody knows. I, right? Some of them might have merit in some place. I don't know. But here's what I do know is that both of them are incredibly hard weights, right? Whether you're doing it publicly or whether you're doing it privately, the weights that you carry when you have something in your life that you wish were different are heavy. The weights that you carry when you wish something was different in your life are heavy, regardless of what you think you should do with them. They're just heavy, okay? Um, and I think some of us have some type of blindness, right? Um, some type of problem that we wish we didn't have. And everybody coming in 
are carrying weights. Some of them, um, some of those weights are being processed through therapy right now. Some of us are navigating uh, things with our kids that we're not sure how to navigate through. Maybe, uh, maybe it's teenagers now that you're trying to figure out, okay? Just hang on, <laughs> they'll get through it, right? Maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's just a friend. And we're wearing these things and they're real and they're heavy. And sometimes we don't feel like we can see the light of day because things are so heavy. Maybe it's a health issue. And maybe people know or maybe no one knows, right? But we are asking the questions of, what are we going to do with the problems that we are navigating? What are we going to do with these issues that we're facing? What are we going to do with the difficulties that are on our shoulders? What are we going to do with the things that are on our minds that we lay in bed at night and think about? And I think blind Bartimaeus on the side of that road gives us a great roadmap on what steps we can take through the power of Christ in us to move forward and to be what God has called us to be, even with the weights that we carry, okay? So I'd like to spend some time unpacking this uh, text and then uh, and talk about it. Sound good? Get it? Good. All right. So if we're going to take a step forward, which is the which is the which is the title of this message intro here today, uh, the first thing that we need to do, and we learn this from Bartimaeus, is that we need to recognize that begging for for Bartimaeus did not bring him freedom. The begging did not bring him freedom. Go back to verse 46, and you can see it. He said, with a, they were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. In other words, it was real time. That's what he was doing. He was doing it the day before, and he's going to do it the day after. The begging did not bring him freedom. He he didn't do anything to cause that. He didn't. There's nothing he could physically do to get out of it. He was blind. It was the first century. They didn't have what we have today. Like, it's not because he's not, like, wanting to do something. It's not because he's a bad guy. He's just stuck. But the bottom line is, when he was begging, that begging didn't bring him freedom. It caused him to exist, which was good, but it didn't bring him freedom. There was no breakthrough. And we got to believe together as we look at this text that every person that was on the side of the road begging didn't want to be on the side of the road begging. They wanted to be free. They didn't want to be in the situation that they were in. But they were stuck. And life had happened to him. Okay? Uh, but all of the years of begging, and I'm, we're assuming it was years. We don't know how long it was. didn't bring any freedom. It was his position in life. And we're just assuming that he wanted to get out of that state, okay? And I got to believe that he was hoping that someday begging would lead to some kind of breakthrough. And it was all he knew. It was all he knew, okay? But that begging did not actually elevate him and take him to a place of getting out of bondage. It was his bondage. Begging was his bondage, right? And this is where we often find ourselves, don't we? If we can bring it back to us for a minute. Nobody understands what I'm going through. No one understands the battles that I'm facing. And we are hoping, ready? Here it is. We are hoping that doing the same thing over and over and over again will somehow lead us to breakthrough. And the longer that we feel stuck, the more embittered that we feel. The more angry that we become, either at people, ultimately at God. I know married people like this. I know older people like this. I know singles like this. Nobody gets me. And when you live long enough, there, listen to me. When you live long enough in the bondage that either you have caused or what's been given to you, whatever your situation is, when you live there longer and longer, and you keep saying, nobody gets me, nobody gets me, nobody understands, nobody gets me, nobody understands, when you keep doing that internally and then outside, you end up becoming victims. You become a victim of the bondage that you're in. That's just what happens. And as long as you live in a victim mindset, my friend, 
It does not bring you to a place of freedom. It keeps you stuck. It keeps you stuck. That's just the way it works. And then, here's what's so cool about this story. Bartimaeus is stuck in a situation, but then there happens to be a day. There's a day when Jesus passed by. There's a day when Jesus passed by. And we see it here in verse 47. Look at verse, we've read it, but look at verse, when he heard that it was Jesus, son of Nazareth. Now listen, this guy was hopeless. He felt hopeless. But when he heard, that Jesus of Nazareth was there. He couldn't see him. So what did he do? Because he couldn't see him. He couldn't run after him. He couldn't get to him. What did he do? He began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. There was a day when Jesus passed by. In the midst of his bondage, Jesus passed by. And something, I, when he passed by, I don't know what it was, but something in Bartimaeus clicked. It clicked. In this moment that we see right here in Scripture, this man said, I don't want to stay where I am. If there's any hope in the name of Jesus... If there's any hope in the person of Jesus, if this man from Nazareth that everybody's talking about is who he says he is, that he has power over life and death and power over all of the things of the world, if he really is who he says he is, then I've got to get in the room with him. I've got to get some kind of, like, I've got to get noticed by him. Something clicked. And I would love to ask what happened in his mind. But I can assume some things, and so can you. He said, I don't want to be stuck in the same cycle I've been in forever. I want to move from where I am right now to where I'm dreaming to be. And I don't know about you, but I feel like right now in our church, I feel like in many people's lives right now, this season, this time, this year, is a day, maybe a season that you're saying, you know what? I don't want to be here forever. I don't want to be in this spot forever. So what blind Bartimaeus does, it says, he said, I'm going to shout to Jesus as he's walking by. And that shout, you know it, but don't miss it. That shout is what changed his life forever. Changed him forever. Now, there are some obvious applications to this, and we know that. But let me just kind of challenge you at your core, kind of your mindset. So important for us to understand this. You need to remember, and I need to remember together, right? We need to remember this together, right? You need to remember that God didn't, or excuse me, that you didn't make you. God made you, right? Turn to the person on your right and say, you didn't make you. To the person you're left and say, God made you. Right? You didn't make you. God made you. I love the people in the aisles. What do I do? Do I do I? Right? You didn't make you. God made you. You need to remember that you didn't decide to be born. God decided for you to be born. God is the one that put you on this earth for this time in your life, as he said uh, uh, in Scripture, for such a time as this. God's the one that put those talents in you. God is the one that put those gifts in you. God is the one that put the abilities inside of you. You didn't do it. God made you. You didn't make you. 
And since he put them there, he did not put them there so you'd stay on the side of the road begging your entire life in bondage to what you think will somehow serve as breakthrough, but all that it is is causing you to exist. He put those inside of you so you could take your first step forward and be everything that he called you to be, including walking through the struggles that you have. Listen, 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 listen. There is the grace of God flowing through your veins. There is the grace of God flowing through your veins. He made you. He created you uniquely. Even with what you think are situations or hindrances or obstacles or shortcomings that keep you from experiencing it, God made you. You didn't make you. And because you didn't make you, and God made you, he is the one that unlocks the things in our life that bring us out of the bondage into the purpose for your life. There is grace flowing through your veins. You are not here just to exist and take up space. You are here to make on earth as it is in heaven for this generation. In your family, in this church, in your workplace, wherever your little circle of the world is, he put you there. And so Bartimaeus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Guess what? His eyes, although blind, were on Jesus. Were on Jesus. Have mercy on me. And guys, I want you to know this. It is Jesus that we offer to you today. It's not self-help. It's not a roadmap to a better you. No, no. We offer you Jesus and him crucified and resurrected for the glory of God, for the forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life for all who call upon his name. We offer Jesus to you today. So the first thing that we know is that we look at Bartimaeus as we want to take our first step forward. We understand that begging, right? That begging did not bring him freedom. Okay, get it? Good, all right. So the second lesson we're going to learn from Bartimaeus, uh, we're going to see in verse 48. Go to verse 48 with me. We already read it, but we're just reviewing it. It says that many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. Many rebuked him, but told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, which I love. But many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. Listen, here's the thing that we're going to learn. We're going to learn that when you decide to yell out to Jesus, call out to Jesus, and begin to change, and we'll talk about that in a minute, there will be some opposition. And it will come in many forms. Okay, you might be the greatest opposition to your growth. Might be other people, might be circumstances, whatever, right? But you have to expect that someone or something is going to try to keep you where you used to be. Right? People looked at Bartimaeus and looked at him and said, stop it. Right? Don't do that. Now, here's what's interesting uh, about it. If you were a blind man uh, or uh, someone that was lame, that, you know, crippled or whatever, and you were on the side of the road, you were begging— Right? We know from John chapter 9 that the disciples asked Jesus, hey, what was it that caused this man to be crippled? Was it a sin of his parents or a sin of himself? There was this belief in first century, in the first century, that if you were crippled or had some kind of disease, that someone, somewhere, someone along the line or you yourself committed some sin that you deserved it. Okay? So Bartimaeus was looked at this way, and so when people uh, heard him shouting, they turned to him and rebuked him, like, listen, you kind of deserve where you, where you are. Like, like that's, that's, that's your life now, so blame your parents, blame yourself, 
whatever you want to do, but that's kind of where you deserve to be. How awful is that? How awful is that? Now listen, I've known some pretty mean people in my life, some really mean people, but the meanest people I've ever met in my life, never have I ever heard them say to a blind person, get out of my way. Never did I hear them like push them aside so they could get to the front of the line. Right? But these individuals, because of their belief about why they were where they were, told him to be quiet. So when he called out to Jesus of Nazareth, when he shouted, he said, listen, he's the only one that can help me. I am shouting to Jesus. People stood up and said, stop it. He's not going to listen to you. Listen, when you decide to shout to Jesus and you begin to make the moves that God is moving in your heart to make, there's going to be some opposition. Someone, something, some circumstance, you yourself, explanations, there's justifications, there's all these different things that are going to come up in your life that's going to, and you sometimes will rebuke yourself. Or you'll have a well-meaning person that will tell you, well, you know, I've been there before, so it probably won't happen. You know, or you know, you, you're the kind of person that starts things but never finishes them. There'll be some opposition in your life. Okay? Maybe it's voices in your head, I, you know, whatever it is. But Bartimaeus came back and he said, listen, I know you're telling me to stop, but I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping. And he shouts all the more, the scripture says. Now, here's what I found, find fascinating. It was after the rebuke and Bartimaeus shouting over top of their rebuking that Jesus then turns and says, call him. Call him. He is coming after me with the kind of faith and belief that I am who I say I am, and he's shouting over the crowd. Remember, it was a large crowd shouting over the crowd so that I would hear him. And anybody who shouts like that, get him. Call him. I want to interact with this guy. Mark 10, 49, look at this. Jesus stopped. Now just, just, just picture that for a second. He's walking along. There's hustling, there's bustling, there's noise, there's people probably shouting at him right? It was a large crowd. And when he heard Bartimaeus, he stopped. He stopped. Call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up. On your feet. He's calling you. Woo! Now, now here's what is, now this is a sidebar. This is level five interpretation. It's free. You don't have to pay for this thought. Okay? A verse earlier. The Bible says that people were rebuking him for shouting. Jesus then turns and says, call him. And then people got excited for him. Now, I think Jesus was probably talking to his disciples. Okay, I think it's probably safe. Uh, but maybe there were other people that like flipped and said, oh, well, Jesus is calling him. I'm excited for you now. Here's all I'm going to say about that. Be mindful and wise with the people that you run with. Be mindful and wise about the people with whom you run with. Make sure when you are looking to find your people that they're really the people that you can share your life with. They're going to be with you. They're going to see it through with you. Just a thought. I can't prove any of that in scripture. Just a thought. I think I can, but it's a thought. Okay? Get it? Good. Again, that's free. It's a, it, okay. So the second thing we see is understand that when you are stepping into your next step, and we're going to talk about community here in a minute, but when you're stepping into your next step, there's going to be opposition to it in some way, shape, or form. Okay? That's all right. It's good. Uh, the third thing is we're going to keep moving to make sure I don't 
go over. Uh, as we take our next step, um, our next step shows us that we can be free. So Bartimaeus shouted over, there's freedom that happened. Look at verse 50, look what happened. So we're moving on a little bit in our um, text here. We read through uh, 49, look at verse 50, it's on the screen. But it says this, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Now I find it interesting and fascinating that uh, Mark decided to include this phrase and this action that he took his cloak and he threw it to the side. I actually think that's important. And the reason I think that's important is because some scholars um, actually believe that uh, when an individual that was a beggar, uh, they would actually put on a particular garment so that people would recognize that they are beggars and need help. So this garment quite possibly was his identity. Okay? So he wore something unique so he would be identified. So when people looked at him, listen, here it is, ready? They knew who and what he was. They knew who and what he was by the cloak that he put on. So when Jesus said, call him, and people said, hey, cheer up on your feet, come to Jesus, he got up and he shed what, what was on him. It was the identity that he was wearing. And it was as if Bartimaeus was saying, even before Jesus interacted with him, I want to step into what God has for me in this moment. So he throws his cloak aside. I feel like God is wanting to do that in you and in us through the series and as a church. Maybe today. My prayer is that you will not just show up to church and want to be the same as I said at the beginning. My prayer is that you will throw away your old identity in the name of Christ. To throw away this thing that I'm known for. Maybe I'm known to be this kind of woman, this kind of man. Maybe I'm known for that. But all it's done is brought you bondage and you're stuck in it and you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again and more bondage happens and you're stepping up today and you're saying, you know what? I'm throwing my cloak aside. I'm calling on the name of Jesus. That's what I'm doing. And you step fully into, forward into what God has called you to be. Now, if we go back to our story, we'll go to verse 51. He throws his cloak aside. He comes where Jesus was, because they called him. And Jesus asks him a crazy question. And this very well may be, I say this all the time, don't I? One of my favorite verses in the Bible, right? And I have like 400 of my favorite verses in the Bible. But it very well may be one of my favorites. Look at verse 51. Jesus just simply looks at him and says, I love this. What do you want me to do for you? <laughs> you called, you believe the faith is already there. It's there. You know I can do whatever I decide to do. What do you want me to do for you? Now, that's a painfully obvious question, isn't it? He's blind. Jesus knew that. But Jesus is digging into something deeper. He's saying, you're stuck in what you are. You threw your cloak aside. There's something going on there. And you're looking at me, but you're still blind. You're seeing something in me that many people miss. And I've already recognized in you something that you may miss about yourself. What do you want me to do for you? And the man just looked back at him. The man just said, Rabbi, <laughs> I want to see. And it's almost like a, duh. But it's not. It's not. I think, and I, I would love to see this replayed in real time. I think there was a lot of passion behind that. I think there was a lot of emotion behind that. I think there was a lot of brokenness behind that. 
I think there was a lot of yielding behind that. I think there was a lot of worship behind that. I think it was deep. I think it was heartfelt. I think it was moving. I think the crowd was silent. I think the crowd could not believe what was being said. I think the disciples were in awe of what was happening. I think right there, there is a moment where the God of heaven was on display, and he simply said, what do you want to do? What do you you want me to do for you? And that man, just in his complete humility, his complete surrender, said, I just want to see. just want to see and you're my only hope that's what I think and Jesus says go go to the next verse for me can you go there I'll read it I probably messed that up in verse 52 go said Jesus your faith has healed you immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road (sighs) something was huge guys something happened and it was real now that's unbelievable really is now we're a church I love our church. I was talking about backstage about how much I love our church. But we don't want to be a church that just attends on the weekends, do we? I don't want to be a church like that. No, we need to attend on the weekends. Go home. Jason said I don't have to come to church. Sweet. <laughs> Not what I'm saying. See, what we're offering to you as a church, as followers of Christ, is Jesus himself. He and he alone has the power to help you see what you were blinded from. He and he alone will change you from what you were known for, your identity, to what you can become. And that comes by understanding how we interact with the person of Jesus Christ and what he does. So it's not just the weekend environment. It's, it's, this, it's this engaging with Jesus himself that this begins to happen. So what I want to do is I want to I dig in a little bit, if you'll allow me, to say, okay, now, if we're not just church on the weekends and we want to be people who are shouting to Jesus and we want to interact with Jesus and we want to become what God's called us to be, how does that happen? How does that happen? When we go to Bartimaeus, here's what we know. Bartimaeus was interacting with the physical Christ, right? It'd be like me pulling you up on stage and and interacting with you and everybody watching. He interacted with the physical Christ. Um, But for us, we can't interact with the physical flesh and bone Christ, can we? It's not what we can do in flesh and bone. But here's what we know. As followers of Jesus Christ, Christ is in us, and we are in Christ. So the fellowship of Christ happens, at least in part, when Christ's followers share life together. And they often pull us from the side of the road, meaning the body of Christ, from the side of the road and say, quit begging. And when this is done with the affection of Christ, when this is done with the motivation of Christ, we are pulled from the side of the road and Christ, through the body, ministers to us. And it often happens through the people of Christ. In other words, you and I, if you know Christ, we are the body of Christ. And Christ himself is supreme in the body. We worship him. We are part of Christ. He is in us, and we are placed in Christ. Colossians 1.18 says this, And he, meaning Christ, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. 
And so when we are in Christ and Christ is in us, we are living through Christ. He is supreme. He is the one working. He's the one calling. He's the one equipping. He's the one encouraging. It is Christ in us that does this. We are part of Christ. We are the body of Christ. That's why you and I don't just consume church. We are the church. Because Christ in us is the hope of glory to people, Colossians says. And we follow Christ, and he is supreme over all things. So not only that, there's also a personal intimacy with Christ for us. And there's a relational intimacy with Christ. And Christ says, I've got more for you, but it flows through my body. Let's look at an example. James 5, 16 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to each other. It does not mean that you don't confess your sins to Christ. But as you are confessing your sins to Christ, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. In other words, Christ says, I'm going to unlock my power many times through the body of Christ, spiritually. Okay? The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So we who are in Christ and Christ in us interact with the body of Christ and Christ empowers the body and he moves over in Proverbs 27 17 it says this as iron sharpens iron so one person sharpens another why because we are in Christ Christ is in us and we are the body so we're not interacting with Christ in a flesh and blood experience like Bartimaeus had but when we are interacting with one another with the affection of Christ with the compassion of Christ with the boldness of Christ with the love of Christ with the unity of Christ when we are doing that the power of Christ is revealed in us personally in us as a body that's why we forgive one another. That's why we work through things with one another. That is why we, we enjoy company. It's why we do things like summer at the reserve. right? Because the body of Christ needs to interact and be a part of one another. So we don't just consume on the weekends. We are part of something bigger and greater because Christ is in us and we are in Christ. And so let me draw a conclusion. Many times Jesus does not give us the answer to our prayers and our personal prayer time. He might, but many times he does not. Many times he gives you answers to our prayer through his body. We pray and you ask someone to pray with you. The prayer of a righteous man is power and effective, powerful and effective. Can, can you pray with me? Can we talk about it? And there's an answer that comes to light. Why? Because the body of Christ is doing what the body of Christ is meant to do, to operate with the affection and the power of Christ in us and through us. It's a person of Christ, and it's a relationship that I get connected with so you and i can think it's just me and jesus all on our own but that's not biblical you see when you surrender your life to jesus christ we are grafted into the body of christ look what paul says in first corinthians 12 21 through 27 the eye cannot say to the hand i don't need you and the head cannot say to the feet i don't need you on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are un un unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our pre presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together. He's grafted us together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Don't miss the power in that. 
people say, what would it have been like to interact with flesh and blood Jesus? Well, I'm not sure, but let me tell you something. We are interacting with Jesus when we have the affection of Christ and submission to Christ, and we love each other the way Christ loved us, and we work it through, and we, and we spend time together, and we're committed to one another. It's exactly the love of Christ that we experience. It's exactly the work and the power of Christ that we enjoy. When we see it the way God has laid it out. Okay? So Bartimaeus was accustomed to begging, but his begging didn't give him freedom. What brought him freedom was the person of Jesus Christ. And then he belonged to Christ. The Bible says after he was healed, he, went, he followed, he went along the road with Jesus. What was he doing? He was belonging. He was interacting with the person of Christ. You see, we offer belonging here at Western Reserve, but it's not just to a group of people who are really nice and have really cool mustaches. You've got to go after it. And it may be time for you to call out to the Lord today, maybe for the first time, Lord, have mercy on me. And trust Christ as your Savior. But here's what we invite you to. We invite you to this community. I was talking backstage again. There's some kind of synergy and ownership and camaraderie in this body that in 28 years I've never experienced before. There's something unique that people are doing things that beyond the beyond the call and 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 just filling gaps and learning and do like there's just something really special that's going on i as your pastor could not be more proud of the church that we are becoming and if you are new and you're you're wanting to find belonging i'm telling you there's something really unique here we offer to you life groups like you need to know uh that life groups are a core for us, uh, but we've spent the entire summer um, evaluating the mission and direction of life groups as we move forward to make sure that it's ac actually accomplishing the vision that we have set out for them to be. Uh, and I'm going to be meeting with leaders uh, this week, and then we're going to be rolling out just kind of what do we need to do moving forward to make sure it does that. So we invite you to be a part of that. We invite you... Uh, to be part of our ministries, Bible studies they are going to be launching women's. Uh, Sarah already talked about the scripture memorization, but Bible study for women's and Bible studies for ev everyone for, uh, uh, yeah, across the board. Uh, student ministries uh, are, are growing and, and kids are getting connected. Children's ministry, get your family involved. We offer those things to you. Why? Because we want children and, and, and students and adults to be connected to one another. Because it is through the body of Christ that you find your people. It is through the body of Christ that many of us take our first step. And we want a place for you to find your people. That's what we want. And we'll keep talking about our church as we go here, but I don't want you to miss that. Get it? Good. That was fun. Worship team, come on out. Let's pray, and um, we'll just ask the Lord to do whatever He wants to do through worship and uh, what He wants to do in your heart and your life, and we'll just we'll trust Him. So, Lord Jesus, uh, uh, as we come to You today, we, we come understanding and recognizing that without You, um, we are on the side of the road, symbolically, stuck. Uh, Lord, for some of us... Uh, it, it begins simply and um, most powerfully with our salvation. Some of us are on the side of the road and we've witnessed the church, we've witnessed people, followers of Jesus, and, they've, and they're here because they've seen something different, they've experienced something different, and they're ready to say, Jesus, I believe you are who you are, or who you say you are. I believe that you are uh, God incarnate, that you have come uh, to, to become sin for the world and die and be crucified and then ultimately resurrected for my freedom. I recognize that I'm sinful and that I'm stuck in this bondage. And for some today, they're saying, Jesus, I want to ask you to be my Savior, to forgive me of my sin and for you to become my Lord through faith. 
and you are simply saying, come to me. And God, I pray if there's anybody here that has never made that, have, has never made that decision, but they're ready today, that they would say yes to you, Jesus, and, and that lives would be changed for eternity. Call them from the side of the road. Call them from their bondage. And may they receive you through faith as their Savior. And God, there are other people, lots of us here today, Lord, that um, are on the side of the road, not, not in, when it comes to our salvation and our eternity, but we're just stuck. And God, for some people, they need to call out to you and say, God, have mercy on me and take a step forward. And then to recognize today that taking a step forward isn't a call to isolation. It's not a call to, to just me and Jesus by ourselves. No, no. It's a call to the body of Christ through which you work and you encourage and you indwell and you empower. And God, I pray that you would create a community here that is unmatched, that there's a confidence in the, in the community and the unity and the movement of God through our church, God. And I pray that you would just continue to envelop and develop people. May we be found faithful. Lord, there's going to be some opposition. People are going to want to criticize, or maybe there's going to be the temptation to fight and be stuck in our bitterness. And Lord, Lord, we have an enemy. We recognize it. But in the power of Christ, would you just overcome all of that? Would you cause us to be unified? That's what we pray for. Thank you for being our Savior. We love you. We declare today our allegiance to our Lord in all humility. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.